Okay, looks like I am on. Is that? Yeah, good. Okay. Well, welcome in this dreary evening with the, it wasn't supposed to be this, the weather wasn't supposed to be like this tonight, but what are you, what are you going to do? You live in Texas. Good evening. I am uh, Don Carlton. I'm the executive director of the Dolph Briscoe Center here at the university. And this is a very special occasion uh, for the Briscoe Center as we, first of all, celebrate uh, Black History Month this month. And we're also uh, very appropriately celebrating the acquisition of an important archive, and that's the Stephen Shames Photographic Archive, which is uh, really a significant addition to our holdings of, uh, in our photographic holdings. And on top of that, we have some special guests with us tonight, and uh, so that's exciting as well. But first, let me tell you about the archive of uh, documentary. And, and by the way, I've got a license to operate this, so if I injure myself, I'm injured. Let's get, <laughs> see if we... There we go. Okay. All right, so let me tell you about the archive of documentary photographer Stephen Shames. And... Uh, uh, the Shames Archive consists of approximately 400,000 photographic images spanning the years from 1967 until 2005. The collection includes slides, negatives, contact sheets, and prints that Steve Shames has produced in his career as a photojournalist and as a documentary photographer. Steve's archive covers historical issues broadly related to civil rights, social, economic, and political justice, and human rights. Now this photograph here is from the Shames Archive, and it depicts, of course, it's a picture of the very famous poster of Huey Newton, the co-founder of the Black Panther Party, and with glass shattered by police bullets. Now, a major feature of the Shames collection is this photographic documentation of the Black Panther Party in the late 1960s and early 70s. Shames' other photographic work includes his project, Outside the Dream, Child Poverty in America, a collaboration with the Children's Defense Fund in 1985, a project in 1999 on multiracial Americans, a documentation of AIDS orphans in Uganda in 2000, and street kids in Bangladesh, India, Brazil, Romania, and Honduras. And in the early 1990s, he shot a photo essay for Texas Monthly Magazine uh, about, viol about a violent crime wave in Houston at the time. Steve is also the author of our co-author of 10 books of photography, including Power to the People, The World of the Black Panthers, which he co-authored with Bobby Seale. He's also the author of Bronx Boys, uh, which was published in 2014 uh, by the University of Texas Press. The Shames Archive also contains record albums, books, and magazines that features Steve's photographs. The Shames Collection is really an extremely valuable and significant addition to the center's holdings in historically important photography. He, it joins the archives of more than 40 other leading American photojournalists and documentary photographers. Uh, in fact, the total of our photograph collection now in terms of images is something between 7 million and 8 million images that we hold. It's a significant addition to the center's collection also documenting the history of the American civil rights and other social justice and human rights movements, as well as the history of American news media. This is not a Steve Shames photograph, but I will explain in a moment. We've recently opened an exhibit titled Struggle for Justice, which is in our new gallery located upstairs. Uh, and this exhibit showcases examples from our photography collections that document the civil rights and black power movements, all selected from the collections of the photographers uh, whose archives are housed at the center, including the Flip Schulke Archive, 
which is the largest single collection of photographs of Dr. Martin Luther King in existence. Also the photographs of the archive of Charles Moore, who famously documented the protests in Birmingham, Alabama in 1964, uh, among other events. We have the, the archives of African-American Texans as well, photographers. R.C. Hickman of uh, Dallas and Calvin Littlejohn of Fort Worth. And, of course, we have the archive of Spider Martin, whose uh, photographs documented the Selma movement, among many others. And this is uh, one of the photographs from uh, Spider Martin's archive. This is the two-minute warning at the Edmund Pettus Bridge right before the Alabama State Troopers weighed in with uh, their clubs and, and beat the uh, people uh, there at the uh, bridge. I, at this point, I want to introduce a special guest. I want to ask, uh, we have Spider Martin's daughter here with us tonight. She came over from Birmingham, Alabama. Would you please stand, uh, Tracy? Tracy Martin. Okay, so after the conclusion of our program this evening, I really want to invite everyone to come upstairs for our, our reception, uh, book signing, book signing, and also a viewing of the exhibits in our galleries there. We have two different exhibits, Struggle for Justice, and also an exhibit of Stephen James's Black Panther photos as well. Now I want to introduce my friend Steve Kasher, who has also joined us tonight. Steve's made the trek down from Manhattan. Steve's the author of The Civil Rights Movement, A Photographic History, 1954 to 1968, which has remained in print for over 20 years now, which is a remarkable achievement. Steve is an author, <clears throat> an editor, a publisher, an exhibits designer and curator, and a businessman who owns the Stephen Kasher Gallery on West 26th Street in Manhattan, New York. Steve's curated more than 30 major exhibits of photographs for museums and galleries around the world, and he is widely acknowledged as an expert on the photography of the civil rights movement. I don't know anyone who has done more to promote the work of photographers who have visually recorded the civil rights and black power movement, as well as those uh, who have documented social, economic, and political justice topics. Please welcome Stephen Kasher. Steve, you want to come up? Have a seat. We're going to sit down. and talk. Have oh. a, turn your microphone on. Okay. I hope it's on. Is his mic on? Is my mic on? Hmm. I was expecting to just talk. But yeah, this is no, great. we're just gonna we're gonna spend a few minutes talking, and uh, thanks for joining us tonight, making the trek down from New York. Thank, actually, can I start by thanking Don? I mean, this is um, a dream for me to be uh, making a presentation with three of my heroes. Um, we'll be hearing more from Steve and Bobby, but um, Don didn't really blow his horn enough. He is the founding director of the Briscoe Center. The Briscoe Center is one of the great uh, places, repositories and places to do research on American history, one of the greatest in the world. And he basically built it from scratch. So um, I I'm just so pleased and honored to be, be on the stage with him. Thanks, Steve, I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, it's been a lot of fun, I have to say. The now, tell us a little bit about uh, Steve Shames's work and, uh, and the importance, really. You did the book on civil rights photography. Uh, say, discuss just a little bit about the importance of photography in the civil rights movement, as well as uh, Steve's work. So um, we're, we're here tonight to honor and celebrate and give gratitude to the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement with a capital C, R, and M is really a historical um, moment. You can fiddle with the edges, but I think most historians would agree it's somewhere from around 1954 to around 1968. That's from Brown versus the Board decision by the Supreme Court that 
made uh, segregation illegal in um, schools till the death of Martin Luther King. That's sort of a def defined period when, when a lot of organizations came together and, and had a great effect. And the inspiration, the model that was set up by, the, by that movement resounds to this day. And it led um, directly to uh, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, environmental movement, um, Black Lives Matter, you know, you can go on and on and on, and black power movement. Um, so Stephen Shames uh, joined, uh, a, well, the, the history of the civil rights movement is a history of images. It's a history of pictures. So the pictures bring that history to us. But at the time, the pictures were a very important part of making the movement function. The um, activities of the civil rights movement were largely demonstrations to be recorded and disseminated by the media, by photography, by newspapers, by magazines, by television, by you know, film that was shown on television. They didn't have video then. Um, so the, the images and the movement are, are, are integrally supporting each other and functioning together. It's not just um, a remnant recording. It's, it's, uh, the movement was making images. Stephen Shames is um, a great example of how that worked. The people who made images of the movement can be broken down into three categories. Journalists working for magazines, um, artists who are working independently to find meaning, to express themselves through these images and expressing the meaning of what was going on. And the third group is movement photographers, movement uh, image makers. These are people who were um, members of a movement organization who were in the movement and making images as an expression of their uh, movement activity, of their, of their um, being part of all this. So Steve is really book two of those, let's say, or maybe three of those. He's all three categories. Um, I think he, he uh, functioned originally as a movement photographer because he met Bobby Seale and he'll tell you that story, and became the unofficial, official Black Panther photographer. Um, he was a, a photojournalist. He carried a, a, a press pass. He worked for various magazines, which uh, newspapers that he'll tell you about, the Berkeley Barb, the Black Panther newspaper, um, et cetera. And later on, he became an artist by being exhibited in museums and galleries and places like here. I mean. This, this term art is, is, we can debate all about that. Um, and so, you know, Steve is one of the important and, and really committed and um, uh, producer of great imagery that brings this history to us today. Sounds very good. Long answer. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's great. Well, thanks, Steve. I wanted you to say something about, uh, so Shames wouldn't have to brag about himself and... Great uh, job. So thanks, Steve. We'll just move on. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we've talked enough. We've talked enough about Steve Shames. I want to introduce him now. I've already mentioned some of Steve's accomplishments as a photographer, uh, but I also want to add that Steve's outstanding body of work has been recognized with numerous awards, including the Kodak Crystal Eagle Award for Impact uh, in Photojournalism and awards from the International Center for Photography, the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Justice and Human Rights, World Press, and uh, the New York Art Directors Club as well. In addition, uh, Steve has prints uh, from his work in the permanent collections at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, and the African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Please join me in welcoming Stephen James. <laughs> Steve, we're delighted that you're joining our Briscoe Center family. And, uh, Hope that uh, you enjoy that as well. But uh, happy to be here. We're uh, is this I wanna, on? I guess. Yeah, yeah, you're on. 
I want to take a couple of minutes to, uh, before we get into any kind of discussion, I want to flip through a few of, uh, of Steve's photographs up here. And uh, then we're also going to, we're not going to comment on them. We can go back to them if we want to. Uh, but then we're going to focus on a few, uh, and I'll let Steve make some comments about them. But just going to look at a few here without comment. So let me see if I can work this magic machine. Well, this is, of course, from your collection, and Angela Davis. And this is, of course, selling the Black Panther newspaper. This is a photograph from the uh, preschool breakfast program that the Panthers sponsored. And this is one of the Panther School. And of course, a voter registration project that the Panthers ran. And this is a boycott against a merchant there that the Panthers were running. Photograph of Kathleen and Eldridge Cleaver. And this is a photograph of Huey Newton on protest line, picket line. Uh, I believe that was in Oakland, right? Was that in Oakland? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's start with this one. Can you see, you and you want to turn your, yeah, your no, so you can see. see. I, I know the picture. You want to identify? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought, I didn't know if I, you knew that. I, I just want to say this is the largest crowd that's ever, I, you know, like our president, I'm going to just... <laughs> I, I'm the greatest photographer that ever lived. This is the largest crowd that's ever come to a lecture, and that's the greatest. No, I'm joking. But anyway. Um, <laughs> so what are we looking at? So this is a, a photograph of Huey Newton and Elaine Brown, who were uh, Panthers. And what, one of the things that is unique about this collection of, of, of photos that you probably you know, may, may not have, have, have seen is that I was allowed access to the Panthers. So here's a kind of behind the scene. This was in Huey's apartment in, in, in Berkeley. And it was just, you know, showing people, people as people. And, and this collection of pictures, one of the things that I think is unique about it is you get to see not only the public face of, of the Panthers, but also the, the private moments. Yeah, that's so that's what this, you know, this picture illustrates. What's going on here, Steve? Well, that's Bobby Seale, and he was the chairman of the Black Panther Party, and he's giving a speech in, in Defermary Park, which the Panthers named Bobby Hutton Park. Bo Bobby Hutton was one of the um, four, one of the six original Panthers. He was a 17-year-old uh, kid that Bobby mentored when he was running the, the poverty program, and then he later became a Panther, and he was shot in the back. Um, another example of someone shot in the back while assaulting a police officer, um, which we've had some recent a examples of, of, of that. Um, so he was, he, Bobby was speaking, I think that was a free Huey rally. Huey Newton was in jail at the time, and um, I, I must say, Bobby was a charismatic uh, speaker. I, he's still great. Um, but I, I put him in a category with, with Martin and Malcolm in terms of uh, he could really m move a crowd. And you can see the, the dynamics. And this is um, Bobby and Huey in Huey's apartment. And in the middle of them is, is um, big man Albert Howard, who was one of the six original um, Panthers, who also I got very, very, very uh, close to, to him. But again, it's the behind the scenes moment, Bobby and Huey were talking about something and um, they just allowed me to be there. You know, I was just around. Well, that's the thing that, you know, that, that really grabs my attention is how you got a lot of candid photographs in your collection. I mean, you know, they clearly weren't posed and they did give you great access. That's one of the really splendid things about the collection, in my opinion. Here's another, this looks like a press conference. Yeah, this was um, in 1972, 73, Bobby Seale ran for mayor of Oakland. And I was with him almost every day. I was part of the campaign. And Bobby ended up getting 40% of the vote. He didn't win. But in the next election, um, a black man became the first African-American mayor of Oakland. The Panthers really um, opened up. You know, they were really focused. Bobby especially was really focused on getting black people, women, other, quote, I say so-called minorities, because in the world they're not minorities, but in the United States we call them minorities, um, elected to office. I, I think 
Bobby said in, in the book that in 1968, he did some research, and, and in the whole United States, from the president to school boards, and local county offices, county sheriffs, all the elected officials, of which there were half a million elected officials, there were only 50 African Americans in 1968 in the whole country. Obviously, that, that, that changed, um, and we ended up having a, a, a black man um, elected president in the United States, and there are you know, many more elected officials. And the Panthers were very instrumental in, in getting that started. Now this is, you know, this is uh, another, uh, can you tell us what's going on here with Huey? The this, poster um, kidnap. Yeah, yeah, this is in, um, oh, where is this? I can't remember where this is, but Bobby, at, at one point, um, you know, all the, 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 the government went after all the Panthers, and so um, Eldridge Cleaver had to leave the country, and, and Huey, you know, had a trial and was in jail for, for many years, and at some point, um, someone in the government, I guess, looked around and said, uh, um, well, we haven't gotten Bobby yet, so they, they indicted, um, and Bobby will talk about that, but they indicted him for, for the... Um, the police riot at the Chicago Democratic Convention, and I, w I was at the um, convention, and um, then later for, um, he was on trial in New Haven for a, a, a police, a, an FBI informant, someone who was in the pay of the FBI and the government, tortured and then later killed uh, a panther claiming that they were a police officer, and then he turned around and said Bobby had told him to do that, and they, so they arrested him and put him on trial for that, and the jury um, said, no, that wasn't, that wasn't true. It was a, a government, you know, this was a government person and the employee of the government who did this. So that's the, what was behind the, the kidnap, that at one point they, they, um, they grabbed Bobby off the streets in, 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 uh, in Berkeley after he had been attending a, a wedding. Um, hence the kidnapped. But yeah, hence different. the kidnapped. Uh, that's, now, that talking that. about, you know, we're just talking about some of the candid photographs you've taken. Now, this is obviously a photograph you took on, you know, on the spur of the moment. You look up here. We've got another image. Um, oh, well, and it's, yeah, it's obviously. That was during Bobby's campaign for mayor. And as I mentioned, I, I was with him every day when he campaigned. So I would ride in the car with him and go to the different events. And this was obviously, I was sitting in the, in the back seat. Um, but this gives you a good idea of the access that uh, that he had to. Yeah. Uh, well, I was kidnapped. Uh, Bobby kidnapped me, and <laughs> <laughs> I was in the yeah. car there. <laughs> what do we got here? Well, this was a, a campaign. They, they, this was a staged photo that I did that they yeah. used as a as a poster and and then the campaign brochure. Bobby ran for mayor, and Elaine Brown ran for city council. In, in Oakland, and this was the picture that they they wanted to put on the brochure. So they got a bunch of people together, and I got up on a on a ladder, and I, I took this picture. So this was, um, you know, this was the picture that the campaign wanted for for the campaign brochure, um, and I was the the guy they asked to do it. So uh, you they, know they couldn't get anybody really professional or good to do it, but they yeah, right. they got me. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe him. You just heard his credits. So, uh, well, this is this is just a you know this is a tiny sample of the four hundred thousand images that we have here. Would be here for the next two or three years if we showed you. Show, you're not going to show all 40, 400,000? No, we, we decided oh. we didn't have enough time and oh, everyone well. would get hungry and thirsty. <laughs> so before we, um, uh, I'm going to switch over. We're going to introduce, uh, I'm going to get you to introduce uh, uh, Bobby in just a second. But I'd, I'd like to, we have another special guest here that I want to introduce. Uh, and that is uh, John Creer. John was a leader of the Black Panther Party in Houston. And John, would you stand up and be recognized, please? So, um, and John is also uh, is driven up from Houston for this as well, so we're glad to have you here, John. Um, Steve, I think it'd be very appropriate if you'd introduce uh, Bobby Steele. Okay. Um, it's actually uh, my honor. I mean, Bobby was a mentor of mine. 
I, I met him in, uh, the first picture I took of him was 1967 at the first peace march against the war in Vietnam through um, in San Francisco. And Bobby and Huey were selling uh, Mao's Little Red Books, which they used to, to raise money. And I just saw out of the corner of my eye, I was marching. My dad had come up from, from Los Angeles to march with me. And out of the corner of my eye, I just saw these two guys. And there's something about them just captured me. I mean, they just, I can't explain it, but they, they just, this was reeking of charisma. You know, they, it was just, wow, boom. Took one, one frame, because I was a student. I, I didn't graduate to university in 69, so I, I wasn't a professional photographer at that time. I was just marching. I took this mm -hmm. picture. And later, they were, I was a student at Berkeley, and, and Bobby and, and other Panthers were, were always at the, the university selling red books, giving speeches, talking. And so I got to know them, and, and I brought some pictures by the office, and Bobby liked my pictures, and, and so I started taking pictures, and they would use them in the, in, the, in the Panther paper. But I was also working for the Associated Press and the New York Times and stringing for the Washington Post, and, and so, you know, I was kind of doing both things. But it's an honor, and Bobby became like a mentor to me, and, and uh, Berkeley at that time was having the, uh, was on strike to create in, in 68 and 69, Berkeley campus was on strike to create the, one of the uh, first uh, black studies uh, um, uh, departments in the United States and San Francisco State was also having a strike. Um, Bobby, a few years earlier, had actually uh, created the first, I, I believe, the first African-American kind of studies curriculum at Merritt College. Um, but this was, these were the They're first ones at, at, at universities. <clears throat> and so I, you know, nobody was going to class, so I kind of, I guess I, I studied, I, I took black studies from Professor Seal, and I, I was hanging out with the Panthers and really learning, you know, about community organizing and everything. And one of the things I learned is that, you know, Bobby really is an important historical figure. Um, Bobby was very instrumental in, in the Panthers, not only were, were registering people to vote, and I think Bobby can tell me, but I think they registered tens of thousands of, of, of people to vote. Um, but he, Bobby also was very instrumental in starting the, the programs in the community and really being engaged in the community. So they started, the, the first program they started was the Breakfast for Children program. And that you know, Lyndon Johnson, who some of you Texans may have, may have heard of. He was a kind of famous, famous guy from Texas. And he- We're uh, in his house right now. Yeah, you lived exactly, here, right? yeah, exactly. Right, right. And I don't know, Lady Bird never, never posed naked like the current um, <laughs> uh, first lady. But anyway, um, she was wonderful anyway, even Eastern though California. she never did that. Um, I, I guess all future la first ladies are going to have to pose naked now. I guess we've got new, new, new career. You know. He went to school in the Bay Area, so <laughs> forgive him. <laughs> so. But anyway, um, no, and anyway, all joking aside, Lyndon Johnson started... The, the, you know, the, the breakfast for children with the federal government after the Panthers, because the Panthers um, uh, started that. And I think 28 state, state legislators, legislatures also enacted um, breakfast for children programs, but all because of, of the Panthers. The Panthers also started a free medical clinic, which if you look at the history getting going up to Obamacare, you can see a direct you know, historians will document that the Panthers really, the idea that medical care, and this is all Bobby Seal. I mean, the other Panthers obviously were involved, but Bobby was the one who started these, these programs. And even acupuncture um, was, the, the Panthers were very instrumental in bringing acupuncture for drug treatment and stuff to, to the United States. They had in all 60 um, community programs. They had shoe programs. They were giving away clothing. They would give away bags of food. And again, I don't know if any of you ever received government um, food, a famous you know, government cheese. The Panthers didn't give that away. Bobby put a, a very healthy food in there, including a whole um, chicken. 
in, ev in, every, uh, in, in every bag of food. And I know at some of the rallies, the Panthers would give away 10,000 or more bags of, 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 of food you know, to the community. So really the idea that you needed to be embedded and involved in the community and taking care of the people's needs was number one because people were hungry and people didn't have jobs and, you know, all the issues that, that of course, have all been just solved by the current administration. But, um, you know, that, but back then <laughs> there were all these problems. And, um, and, um, you know, Bobby was, was very, very instrumental in that. And I think, you know, that the Panthers and, and Bobby made a, a way to organize, which unfortunately the left and the Democratic Party have kind of, kind of moved a, a, away from that, what was being done in the civil rights movement and, and, and by, by the Panthers. You know, at election time, everyone gets all upset to, to organize, but then in the meantime, you know, the left has kind of left that to, to the right wing to be organizing in the, in, in the community. And I, I think the model that Bobby Seale initiated is a model that if we want to take back this country, we're going to need to think about that. It's not enough. I mean, all these marches are great. And I went on with my wife and, the, and, the, and both of the women's marches. But it's not, that's not enough. You know, protest isn't enough nowadays. You actually need to be in the communities, and Bobby may talk about that um, more, but I, I think that that's a model. So it's my pleasure to introduce Bobby Seale, who really has changed the history of the United States and the world. Bobby, why don't you stay here where you can... Do you want him closer yeah. to you? No, this is fine. This is okay. fine right here. Uh, Bobby, yeah. welcome to the uh, University of Texas, Bobby. And it's a great honor to have you here. I have admired you for many, many years. And uh, so it's really exciting to have you here with us. I, why don't we start off the discussion? Uh, if, why don't you talk a little bit about the famous 10-point uh, program that... Uh, the Black Panthers had, or, or just tell us about the Panthers. We have a lot of students here. You know, it's been you know, quite a while since you were active, the Panthers were active. So tell us about the Panthers. Well, um, I was uh, a young man uh, before I got involved in the protest movement. I had great jobs and stuff like that. I'd done four years in the United States Air Force. I was out of the Air Force and worked in most aircraft companies up and down California and wound up working on the Gemini missile program, a NASA project at Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics in Oakland, California, just outside of Oakland. And uh, I was just a high-tech man and I was a lucky young man to grow up and raise a carpenter and a builder from a young man. My father built our first home in Port Arthur, Texas. Uh, when I was seven years, seven and a half years old, he finished that house. My father was a master carpenter and builder. His brothers and my aunt, his sister, were carpenters. My grandpa built uh, housing uh, for some oil shale companies in uh, Weirgate, Texas, back when it was uh, initiating some oil shaling there. And uh, it was the banking group, the Seal family, who uh, were the bankers in um, Jasper, Texas at the time. And uh, there was some 500 homes to be built. But because the bank supplied the money, et cetera, and we was connected with the family there, et cetera. My grandpa was the main contractor, although there was segregation. The whites work on this side and the blacks work on that side. But regardless, I'm just trying to tell you the background of where I come from in terms of uh, 
the high-tech world, architectural design and stuff by the time I'm 15 and 16 and all that kind of stuff. Through the Air Force and out of the Air Force, and I wound up moving across the street from uh, Merritt College, enrolled as an engineer and design major. And at the same time, I'm working my job on the Gemini Missile Program. And uh, I sort of got involved looking at the civil rights thing and what have you. Uh, I went to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak in the Oakland Auditorium in Oakland, California, and uh, got off with me. You know, uh, I had stopped many years before that going to the <coughs> Holy Roly Baptist Church, you know, that my family went to and my Aunt Zelma went to and stuff like that because I got tired of all the hell and damnation every week, you know what I mean? <laughs> Especially when you was a kid, you know, it just traumatized you. <laughs> <laughs> and I like science and stuff and all that kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> My Aunt Zelma, man, that's, that, that, see, they were twins. My mother's <laughs> Zelma and her sister Zelma, they were identical twins. But uh, Aunt Zelma, her personality was just as opposite of my mama was just a passive, nice Christian. Aunt Zelma was a mean, she gonna drive it down your throat. <laughs> and uh, it, it really is like, I'm in the, I'm what, 11, turning 12 or something, and I'm in the back room, and other kids from the community is in the back room, and, uh, I'm, I'm telling them, no, it ain't, no, it ain't. The, uh, the earth is 25,000 miles all the way around the earth. And then, and then the earth spin on its own axis at, at, at a thousand miles an hour. And then the earth, the earth take a 600 million mile trip all the way around the sun every 365 days. And then when Aunt Zelma heard this, she was in the front room. <laughs> Aunt Zelma busted in the room, come here, boy, grabbed me by the ear and started mauling my head, you're going straight to hell. That science <laughs> mess you talking, boy. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to, I don't know what Galileo went through. <laughs> if this was the Inquisition. <laughs> I mean, this woman, this woman, yeah, you're going, where's my son at? I was, that's her, her son. I'm 12, 12 days old. These women were pregnant at the same time with her son and my son, my, whatever, I don't know. But Aunt Zelma thought the earth was flat. That earth was talking about earth, it was flat, 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 boy. And I think it was, what, six or seven months later, somehow or another, we got over to the, to the beach in San Francisco and we was next door to Playland. And, you know, people went to, you know, look out at the Pacific Ocean. When Aunt Zelma came there with her boyfriend from church or something, and she knew we was all there, and she comes all the way over to get into the carnival area, and boom, and grabs it, come out, Bobby! <laughs> she drags me all across the street and makes me look out there and say, look out there! It's flat, flat, flat. You see it? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, if you going to hip, <laughs> I'm telling you, I mean, and boom, I just try to stay out of the way of his <laughs> But I did not give up my size. I knew the earth was round. <laughs> I knew it spin on its axis, you know. Uh, I ain't done with ideas and understand on that level. Just, she didn't know no better, just didn't correspond correctly to reality. And so I've always been about trying to make sure my understanding of what's going on course, my correction to reality. And growing up a carpenter and a builder and being an architect for my father and his, his, his uh, contracting buddy, uh, his, his contracting buddy would come around and say, George, uh, we're going to add a room and a den over here, et cetera, and can we get your boy to draw some more plans? And, I would do that, you know, I'd draw them to specs, specifications and building code and spec all the materials and all that kind of stuff for three-dimensional structure and layout. 
And they would take those plans and put their name, put their name on. They gave me twenty-five, thirty dollars. I had a lot of money back in them days. Twenty-five, thirty dollars. These guys did the money, and um, I used to do that. I was fifteen years old, turning sixteen at that time. Then the United States Air Force Structural Repair High Performance Aircraft. I aced every tech school and cross training program in a matter of no time. And in other words, I come out. Engineer design major. And I went to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak at the Oakland Auditorium. And at the Oakland Auditorium, 7,000 people. I was just one individual. And Dr. King says, And here in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area, Langendorf Bread Company and Kilpatrick's Bread Company would not hire any people of color. He says, And all across America, Wonder Bread Company would not hire any people of color. I say we're going to have to boycott them. And we want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly, we want to make Wonder Bread wonder where the money went. Man, <laughs> that auditorium, that auditorium of 7,000 people and me, I'm just wanting to hit the floor. I was just totally inspired by Brother Martin Luther King. And truly, I mean, you know, it wasn't hell and damnation. It's about trying to deal with Ending discrimination and all that stuff, and uh, that set the tone for me. So when the Civil Rights Bill passed, I quit my job and went to work in the grassroots community setting up programs. And uh, I set up a tutorial program. Me and five other students working together, we did that. And did all our proposals <coughs> and all that stuff and got our 501c3, whatever, et cetera, and went before the boards. So we had a tutorial youth jobs program, the 10th grade, the tenth grade, two to the first grade, the eleventh grade, the second grade, the third grade, the twelfth grade, and junior college paid them a minimum wage, thirty-six hours in the summer and twenty hours in the winter, a year-round program. So you're killing two birds with one stone. You put up an educational program, boom, and some economics with those little paychecks going into those poor and low-income community houses. You know, that is the type of program we put together. And I guess it would be <coughs> 40 years after that, right after my son come back from uh, fighting in Iraq, my oldest son, that the city government of Richmond, California, called me out, the city council, the mayor, and everybody, to Richmond, California, where I had put this program up in that city. And they gave me and my wife and my family and my party members a proclamation for starting the first youth jobs program. So that was where I got off at. That all preceded the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party didn't start until 1966, October. What I was doing there with following Dr. Martin Luther King was in 1964. So that's preceded of it. Later I helped put black history and African studies into the curriculum at Merritt College. Me and 14 other students, and my special friend at Merritt College, which was Bertram Morrell. And we put that in the curriculum, et cetera, and got that done. And uh, then I was, again, now working for the city government at another point there. And uh, I ran the youth jobs program there. And when I created the Black Panther Party, I was actually employed by the city government of Oakland, California. A lot of people say, oh, he was a thug and a hoodlum, you know, running around with a gun. Guns, oh my God. Somebody tried to say Huey Newton taught Bobby Seale everything he knew about a gun. <laughs> Huey Newton was six years old when my father bought me my first 30-30 high-powered rifle hunting deer. We hunted mule-tailed deer up around Mount Shasta. It's, uh, oh my God. And them old black guys there, they was mostly from Texas because they all got moved out there, you know, in World War II. This is when this happened. And them old black guys out there says, come here, boy. Let me show you how to shoot that, that rifle you got there. You come, you can be a big boy like us because they had big 30 yard sixes. My daddy had a big 300 Savage Blabber action. And they taught me how to shoot that rifle at age 13. Huey Newton was six years old and I didn't even know he existed. <laughs> so I'm just saying. That's where I come from, and I, I was lucky to grow up with a lot of trades and skills and wound it up going to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak, quitting my job, and working, finally working for the city government. And I, we created the, the program of the Black Panther Party. 
and I wanted a political party. My problem was that they come out with that book, Black Power. Uh, Kwame Ture, then Stokely, known as Stokely Carmichael and another writer. And so yeah, you know, I hear guys running around talking about, we want black power, we want black power. And I tell these young brothers, I says, you guys are not going to get any power until you take some political power seats. What you talking about? I says, the city council, man, county supervisorial seats. You got to get in there and get some of these political seats to get some economic equity uh, anywhere going on. But, but, but them the white man seats, I see you better try to get some black folks and some colored folks in there, I say, <laughs> to help you out. Anyway, that, this would spin me off to a point where a year later we created the Black Panther Party. In my War on Poverty office, where I work for the city government, we wrote the 10-point platform and program. You know, one point we wanted power to determine our own destiny, our own community, meaning that we wanted to, I, I wanted to, and would organize and try to get people registered to vote and get more politicians, political and uh, progressive politicians. I learned not to do a politician just because he was black. It also had to be the content of his character, as Dr. Martin Luther King had says, you know what I mean? Whether you're black or white or whatever. So, but my point is, that was where I was coming from. So we wrote this 10-point program, and you know, another point we wanted full employment, another point we wanted decent housing, picture, shelter of human beings, another point we wanted our, uh, decent education to tell us our true history, et cetera, another point we wanted into the robbing and exploitation in our community, another point we wanted all black men to be exempt from any, all black men and women to be exempt from any military service in the war in Vietnam because this country is not recognizing our constitutional democratic civil human rights. Uh, another point, we wanted immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people. Another point, we wanted all black persons who've been tried by all white juries to have another trial where you have some of the black people in the community on the jury who represents the average reasoning person in that community. And another point about the penal legal system treating us right, and we summed it up with land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. And that was the general outline that we put together. One point of what we want and a point of what we believe. Full employment. But we, well, I said full employment at the top. Oh, okay. Oh, and then uh, <laughs> at the top. We want full employment for our people. Yeah, that was number two. My point is, and then, so another night we're in my warm poverty office, and Huey is up in the legal aid office, you know, because Huey was in law, two, two years in law school about this time. And so I'd hired him in there as, a, as an adult <coughs> assistant. And he was always up in the legal aid office researching those law books and uh, with rulings and stuff, et cetera, because we had talked about the need to go out and patrol and observe the police since they're beating the hell out of all the people who protest, shooting and killing and murdering them, white and black, et cetera, boom, 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 on the one hand. Two, we have rampant police brutality in the community, so we're going to start out on point number seven. And it, it, it was a thing, you know, to say we're going to go out here and patrol and observe these police. Now, a lot of people think people distort our, our history, okay, boom. Uh, even our own Minister of Information, Eldridge Cleaver, sort of helped distort it. And he's a great writer. This guy wrote see, uh, a Soul on Ice, that book. That book, it sold five million copies, uh, that, that, that book that Eldridge Cleaver wrote. My point, though, is... He was in charge of our weekly publication of Black Panther. And he had a tendency, you know, and Huey Newton was the baddest MF that ever set two feet inside of history. That's that old macho crap description, you know what I mean? That is not the way it went down when we patrolled police, you know what I mean? I was an organizer. And I'd been in the military service. Huey and them didn't even know anything about military service and protocol, et cetera, with guns, weapons, or nothing like that. I knew all of this stuff. So I trained these brothers and sisters, what about the guns, breaking down the weapons, putting the weapons back again, et cetera. And I insisted to Huey, you continue to research every damn law connected with the guns. Because you got the NRA, who stands for the right of guns, et cetera, on the one hand. But at the same time, if we're going to go out here and patrol police and we're going to have guns with us. And the reason we said we was going to have guns with us was too many civil rights people and too many people in the black community just getting shot and killed. I mean, you have to remember, look at the man. 
that was peaceful protesters, uh, Cheney and uh, the, the white civil rights workers, that got shot up, killed, and murdered. Medgar Evers well, shot, killed, and murdered. And, and before that, 1959, Robert Williams in Monroe, North Carolina, this man's an ex-Marine, United States Marine, and he's now out of the Marines, and he was there head of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina, 1959, and he gets downtown, uh, you know, with picket signs, walking in front of Cress's stores or Woolworth stores, trying to say, hire some black folks. They didn't hire black folks in there, you see what I mean? And black folks shopped in there, et cetera, and that kind of, we want, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff we want. The Ku Klux Klan didn't like it after a couple of weeks, and they came in, 20, 30 cars and pickup trucks and they white sheets and uniform, guns, shooting up the whole black community at night. You know what I mean? To, to make them stop, repress their right to peaceful protest. You know what I mean? So we, we, I've read that book and I understood all that. I had, but before I created the party, I read and digested Dr. Herbert Aptacker's documentation of 250 slave revolts because it was pervasive that black folks were docile, they was dumb, and they were stupid, et cetera, boom, 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 boom. And when I read this book, 250 slave revolts this man is documenting, I didn't believe that had happened. I didn't know this had happened in history. And what he documented as a slave revolt involved 10 or more slaves. He said there were other revolts with less that number. He said, I'm just putting in 250 that had involved more slaves from 1800 to 1859, the year or two preceding the Civil War. This blew my mind. And then Dr. Herbert Aptheker did another book documenting all the wars we fought in from the beginning of this very country. You know, people don't know about Lafayette, the French advisor, to uh, French general advisor to George Washington and others, and they're gonna have to fight these colonials. And he went up to New England, and this was the thing that they documented, and was telling the colonials, you ragtag, you guys are gonna get your butt kicked. The king then hired uh, the German Hushin soldiers, and he got shiploads of them coming over here. And he was telling the, the white colonials, these slaves you got here, you should promise them their freedom or something and get them trained to help you fight, et cetera. And this is what Lafayette was doing. And when the German Hushin soldiers many, many months later landed in Rhode Island, who was the significant group that helped kick their butt? Them damn black soldiers. I said, damn, we've been in this shit from the beginning. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but then I read W.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Oh, my God. 168,000 black men was enlisted into the Northern Union Army. 38,000 died, and that's what, that's what really beat the Confederates in this country. And the last, the heavy resistance was in five states. And Abraham Lincoln wrote that Emancipation Proclamation. Now, this was not an amendment to the Constitution. This was an executive order, the Emancipation Proclamation. And it says, and thence we have a fourth free. The very next line says all able-bodied black men will be taken into the Northern Union Army because we cannot conscript enough people down here to try to win this war. And when it was over, Abraham Lincoln had to admit and say, if it had not been for the black men and the people we enlisted into this thing, we would not have won this war. Then the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment solidified it in the Constitution as amendment, the law of the land, boom. In that Reconstruction period was some of the first congressmen duly elected who were black. See, so my connection with that, all the way up to the present when I get ready to start the Black Panther Party, is about we don't have enough political politicians. I found there was only 52 black men who were politicians in the year of 1965 throughout the whole of the United States of America. Now, to me, that wasn't right, because when I did that demographic search, I said, how many political positions, including everything from the local mayors, part-time mayors or city councils, county seats, county supervisorial seats, county sheriffs, all duly elected positions, how many of these positions exist in the United States of America? I found over 500 
thousand political seats one could be elected to in the whole of the United States of America. This is all preceding us putting that Black Panther Party together. And it got off with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> we took that thing out there and we said, let's use the 10 point, point program number seven. And uh, where we want to immediately enter police patrol, we're going to patrol these police, we're going to make an issue out of it and hopefully we will capture the imagination of the people by patrolling them. We had law books, tape recorders, et cetera. We knew every law it was concerning the guns. How not to point a loaded weapon at anybody. If you point a loaded weapon, even have no intention to shoot, if you're playing around and it's a live round in the chamber, that's considered to constitute a loaded weapon under the law. And if you point that at somebody under California law, it constituted assault with a deadly weapon. With no intention of shooting, it constituted assault with a deadly weapon. So we had to train the brothers and sisters how not to do that. While riding in a car, you cannot have a live round in the chamber of a rifle or a shotgun. You can't put that live round into the chamber where it could be fired until you're out of the car. You see, all of this, we knew that. And Huey is researching the laws. He says, now when we go out here, remember only one person talks and no one says nothing until the police say something to you. In other words, you want me to stop? No, okay. <laughs> Keep going. So, yeah, yeah. the point is, you had researched court rulings, et cetera. As long as you're standing there and you say nothing to the cop while he's doing his duty, it's fine. But if you interrupt that cop and say something to him without, before he says something to you, you could be charged with interfering with the police officer carrying out his duty. So we had the law down, and it would be the cop who have to say something first to us. Because in the law and the rulings says if you said something to them and they answered you, you cannot turn around and, and, and interfere, say that they interfere, which you cannot do because you did say something to them. And that's what happened. We waited. We lined up. Geraldine, she had all these earrings on. It's nighttime, et cetera. In the red light, red light nightlife district of, of, of Oakland, California, Western. This is a big, wide street. It had three lanes going this way, three lanes going that way, plus parking. So the police car's out in this main lane near the parking, and we walk up. It's businesses here. It's a Slim Jenkins nightclub. It's a grocery store, and it's a liquor store. Nine or ten people see us walk up. We all got uniforms on. You know, I made them dress, drink, take a bath tomorrow night. What? I says, take a bath tomorrow night, everybody. And I says, I want you to iron your pants, and you iron your, I put a crease in them. I says, you don't want to go out here like you're not organized. I say, people want to go, and, you, and I don't want nobody smelling. Why we got to take a bath? We got to go over here and patrol some old funky cops. I says, wait a minute, brother. <laughs> Reason you got to take a bath, because we not blippies. He <laughs> said, what's a blippy? I say, a hippie who won't take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> I say, you can't go out here telling black folks you're going to be organizing them, and you smelling bad. They'll tell you to, Organize us, boy, you better go organize some soap under your ass before you come out. <laughs> so you can't, you can't, you, you, you got to respect. I mean, I, I'm telling you, teaching these brothers and sisters, see, because they're too grassrootsy. They're not all college students, you see what I mean? We, I'm the college student, and Huey is the college student, and big man Ellen Howard, one of the first women, he's the college student, and the writer and stuff like this here. But the other guys, they didn't even know, you know what I mean? But that was the way I had to do it, we organized it. And when we walked up there, man, and that cop turned around and looked around, you have no right to observe me. And I have to give you his great credit because he did well, good research. And Huey says, no, California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away, a reasonable distance in that particular room that's constituted is eight to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and we'll observe you whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and some sister on the, in the crowd, she said, well, go ahead on and tell it. Is that gun loaded? The cop says, he said, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. 
well, I have a right. You have no right. Well, you cited something, the United States Supreme Court, somebody versus so and so and so and so. You cannot remove a person's property from it without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And a tall black dude over here, he said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I got this stuff written in screenplays. You know, I, I, I've written, I taught myself to write good screenplays, slug lines and all. I'm not just talking about a story, a real screenplay, description of scenes, location, that. So I'm just saying, that's what was happening. It was a discipline thing. You know, and then the cop finally says, well, the gun, Huey says, clap, clap, he jacks around the chamber. Uh-huh. We did not jack around for the chamber when we got it. Remember, you cannot have a live round in the chamber while riding the car of a long gun, right? And he says, clap, clap, and he jacked around. So the other four guys that had rifles, they jacked rounds off in the chamber. And the people said, oh, oh, what's going on? And he said, nothing. And the cop looked, and Huey looked at him. Now, we had a policy. The cop would have to say, you're under arrest. And if he said we were under arrest, we would take the arrest, and that was our policy. But he didn't do that. He got his arrestee, put him in the car, because it was a ticket he'd stopped this guy for. He was standing back there with his hand on the back of the trunk of the police pickup, and put him in the car, boom, boom. And as he's walking away, it's nighttime. Those earrings on Geraldine's ears with her, she had a big 44 pistol Richard Aoki had given her. <laughs> and he stopped, the cop stopped, and he stepped a minute to look, one of them was actually a woman, and he got in his car and left. <laughs> and I turned around, I said, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bobby Seale, I'm chairman of a new organization here called the Black Panther Party, and we're gonna organize the community here, we're gonna unify the people, get the votes together. I'm gonna build a political electoral machine so we can get more political seats, so we can deal with managing the multi-millions of dollars in the county seat, and also the city government, and so on, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow at 5624 Grove Street in our new office that I had put up there, blah, blah, blah. That started the Black Panther Party. But that little scene, word of mouth traveled all over the San Francisco Bay Area. Bobby Seale and Huey Newton got guns and they tell them where the police would get up. I heard that <laughs> people be sometime in San Francisco and places that they heard the, 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 the police is arresting somebody and black folks to holler out the window, better not brutalize them either. If you're gonna brutalize somebody, we're gonna call the Black Panthers over here. <laughs> we're a ragtag organization. We, could, we didn't have no ability to be responding to no situations like that, you know what I mean? We didn't even have the resources for that. But I'm just saying we were a ragtag small organization. That whole first year of the Black Panther Party, we never had no more than 50 people in the Black Panther Party in pieces. Of course, some months later, I led an armed delegation to the California State Legislature because Mulford, the state assemblyman, California was putting a bill in to try to stop us from carrying loaded guns. That was the only way he could do it. And that's the law they were having. So I read, I went up there to read, and Ronald Reagan, our governor, was on the front lawn. They didn't even know we were coming. We really caught him by surprise. Ronnie was over here, you know, 30, 40 feet over there. And he had about 100 or so kids, youth, you know, 10, 11, 12 years of age, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. And he's talking to them, et cetera. And we're over, we're coming up the big walk that leads up to the Capitol steps. And next thing you know, the kids saw us. They thought we was a gun club and they come running over. <laughs> These are young white kids, you know what I mean? And little boys, hey, neat 30 yard six. Is that a 300 Savage? I said, yeah, that's a 300 Savage. <laughs> and so I said, late, and I read my statement in opposition to the pending bill that Marvel was trying to put in to stop us, you know what I mean? And then I says, oh, I asked the press, I says, the spectator section, where is it at? Next thing I got more press, and I went up to the, and we went inside the building, more press, because now I got 50, 60 press people. I says, look, all I want to know it's where's the spectator section where citizens can sit and watch the legislature make law. That's all I want. This way, this way, Bobby. This way, so and so and so and so. And next thing I know, four or five guys get ahead of me, and the, the press, some of the press is leading them, and they lead them inside the chamber. 
And then I walk up, I says, where are we at? This is not the spectator section. And then I hear the gavel, bam, bam, bam. Some president pro temp up there, and I'm at the door. The press are not allowed, bam, bam, on the floor while the assembly's in session, bam. The press is not, and my people, they have their guns not pointing at people, but resting on their shoulders, their rifles and stuff. And they walked all the way up front. The president pro temp did not say anything about the guns, the guy with the gun. It was the press, because it was illegal to go in there with the cameras while the session was in session. And that's what it, I went in, I says, hey, you guys, I walked all the way up, come on, man, get out of here. And I had other state assembly, they started ducking under their desk. I guess it was just too many black guys with guns. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> but I got, I, got, I got my people, I says, come on, man. And a couple of the other guys, I saw them duck. I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. They let me in the wrong place. You know what I mean? I'm trying to apologize. <laughs> you know, boom, boom. I said, come on, you guys. Let's get out of here, man. Boom, boom, boom. So, boom. So, and the news says, hoodlums in Bay Capital. <laughs> That's what Ronnie Reagan and everybody said and all that kind of stuff. And that gave us international notoriety. What did I have? 27 members? Yeah, but 27 members when that happened. But we have anti, we on the front pages of the London Times, we're on the front pages of newspapers all in Japan, it, it, all over the place. We didn't realize, I didn't realize, what we did, I was surprised that even happened that way. So we got this international notoriety overnight. You gotta recognize that number one, like Texas now with, you know, concealed weapon, in, in California, carrying guns was, was legal. And Ronald Reagan, the icon of modern conservatism, passed one of the strictest gun control laws in the nation at the time. The law that they passed said you couldn't have a loaded weapon within 150 feet of any state, you know, property, which public, they, property, public property, which included sidewalks and all roadways. And and all roadways. So basically, I mean, can you imagine if Obama or, or some Democrat had tried to pass a law like that, what all these people would be saying, you know, in Texas and other places? Call me but, back but, that's Ronald Reagan's calling it. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald's upset, but anyway, no, but you know that if you want to think about that, you know, think about that, you know, we have this, they, they talk about the Second Amendment, but when black people tried to exercise the Second Amendment in a legal way, they just passed this, you know, this law. So we're, we're almost, I think we're yeah, we almost, got minutes, we got Bob. about five minutes. Yeah, we're going to lose the auditorium. Bobby, what, what, before we close up here, we got yeah. five minutes. Uh, what do you, what's the meaning of the Panthers today? What, what would you like for people to think about the Black Panthers today? The legacy. Today? We got five minutes. <laughs> I would like to think, act, and involve yourselves in the peaceful way it's supposed to be done into this electoral process, this upcoming election, seven, eight months from now, we have to, we only have 90, what you call progressive voting <coughs> politicians in the House of Representatives. We need twice or three times that many in the House of Representatives throughout the United, for the United States, we do that. We need to take control of that Senate you see what I mean? Now, when Obama first got elected the first time around, they controlled the House and that. And in that period, et cetera, they are the ones that came up with the whole Affordable Health Care Act and pushed it through. You see what I'm getting at? It is these kinds of progressive programs that have to exist, and especially this infrastructure program. I mean, the infrastructure bill was out there way back when the first time uh, 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 Obama ran. That infrastructure bill was key, very, very key. I'm a programmatic person, and I try to tell youth, and I try to tell Black Lives Matter, it's one thing to protest and say, yeah, Black Lives Matter. I said, but it's another thing 
to try to adapt yourself or set yourselves up with a grassroots kind of program in all these little communities in which you exist and get people united. That's what I did. I put up a free breakfast for children program and uh, next thing you know, uh, you know, <coughs> Lucky Stores didn't like Safeway. Well, Safeway was right in front of the church where we set our, where we had our program. And uh, the guy from Lucky Stores says, Bobby Seal, I didn't like you at first. But you know what? Uh, I like the idea of your breakfast program, and I will, since Safeway, it was all in the newspapers, they refused to donate to the Black Panther Party. I will donate you a crate of eggs and a, and a, and a, crate, a, crate, a crate of fruit. You know, boom, boom, boom. Whoa! Right on. I told the guys, go down there, now remember, no arguments, et cetera, be polite, et cetera, and find out what we're getting, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. And get all the information of the lucky stores. We're circulating the Black Panther Party newspaper at that time, 50,000 in the San Francisco Bay Area. I run a full page ad. Lucky Store supports the Black Panthers program. <laughs> Boom. And the right wing is all in the newspaper where we're holding a gun at the, they drew a character holding a gun at the head of Safeway, you know, because we said you should donate to this, you know, because you take $28,000 a week at the time, I guess we would, we would estimate. I mean, this is the kind of stuff. And the breakfast program spread across America as my organization spread across America. I'm talking about, and, and boom. And J. Edgar Hoover got on the national horn. The Black Panthers Breakfast for Children program as a threat to the internal security of the United States of America. <laughs> So the few politicians and the few liberal white politicians and black and Mexican politicians in California state let you pull a bill together for $5 million for all schools for free breakfast, free lunch across the board, sent it to Ronald Reagan, the Republican governor of California at the time. He didn't kill the program. He vetoed $4 million off of it. They took the bill back, ran it through the state senate and the what's name, and they got three quarters vote and overrode his veto and put the whole damn five million in. And over the next year and a half, 28 state legislative bodies across the United States of America did something similar. That was the political organizing success of that program. The idea is now we need to do this 100 more times and other different kinds of programs. You see, boom. From measures to the ballot, what have you. It is an electoral thing. We have to have these kind. Today's most pressing issue that affects all of us, our humanity and our existence, is climate change. Ecological climate change, alternative energy issues. That is the key. And we have to relate to that. And we have to get these right wingers out here feeding I mean, the audacity to have a trillion dollar tax break and then turn around saying, we're spending too much money. <laughs> you know what I mean? And these are billionaires. Yeah. My God, we got to change that, you know? And uh, I stand on that. That was the character in relation to the Black Panther Party. I deal in coalition politics. I did not deal in no isolationist politics, you know? Uh, I'm telling you, whether you're black, white, blue, red, green, yellow, or polka dot, in the final analysis, it's about all power to the people. Through legislative policies, through <laughs> amendments, what have you, et cetera, and so on, on state level, federal level, et cetera. This is the kind of stuff we got to deal with. Yeah. While we maintain and get our education and still try to make a living, and every kid and youth in here who want to make 10 or $20 million, I want you to make it. Just hitch your wagon to the people's human liberation struggle here on our, in our country and on our earth. Power yeah. to the people. Thank you. Uh, Brian, I uh, uh, can I just ask something quickly, Don? We're not through yet. Hang on. What? We're not through yet. Have, have, yeah. Okay, I yeah. just wanted to add something to yeah. what he said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Have a seat. We're just about through here. Finally, now, before we go upstairs, uh, we've got a reception that we hope everyone will come to. And uh, before we go up there, though, I'm very pleased to recognize another special guest with us uh, 
tonight from New York, and that is uh, Johanna Lawrenson Hoffman, who is the widow of Abby Hoffman, the famed anti-Vietnam war leader uh, and social, political, environmental activist uh, who, with Bobby Seale, and I'm talking about Abby Hoffman, who, with Bobby Seale, uh, was one of the Chicago Eight, uh, the anti-war activists who were charged with conspiracy to cross state lines with intent uh, to, cite, uh, to incite riot at the August 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Joanna, please stand and be recognized. Okay, now I invite all of you to come up to our galleries upstairs for our reception, which includes a viewing of our exhibits. We also have some books to sell, uh, and I'm sure that you can persuade some of our speakers just to sign copies for you. Uh, and our speakers are going to join us at the reception, and they'll be available for questions and discussion. And we have staff members posted outside who can direct you to uh, the reception. Thanks again for being with us tonight. Thank you. Oh, you have another. Thank you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I don't have enough books, but we have books. Uh, I brought a uh, hundred or so what I call historical posters about us yeah, and the I Black Panther Party, which are the old front covers of uh, our Black Panther Party newspaper at one time. We evolved that paper from a few sales to a 450,000 circulation around the country one time. But anyway, I have those handy. Uh, and uh, I'm selling those at 10 bucks a piece or something like that. My point, though, is that I, 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 I'm, trying, I'm doing my film, and I have to go for an independent production outside of uh, a lot of people. These other attempts that I've had trying to get this film done more recently here the right wing is behind it. They was trying to uh, kill it. They didn't want my script and my story, et cetera, me, Abby, and everybody. I call it the eighth defendant of the Great Chicago 7 Conspiracy Trial. And they didn't want that because mine, based on all the documents, the Senate investigation hearings against the FBI for attacking us, et cetera, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. So on. That's my story. My story comes that way. And the right wing, I'm talking the Heritage Foundation and the rest of these guys, they do not want this film and my story out there. They're going to let some people make a film, but they're making a film with a lot of distortion, a bunch of FBI counterintelligence program lies in the 60s and the 50s, et cetera, and so on like this here. Boom, boom, boom. And they are actually putting information out. They're actually putting information out. Bobby Seale hated women in the Black Panther Party. Bobby Seale uh, 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 hate LA, LGBT people, et cetera, boom, boom, boom. And they had, this in a, they had to have a big debate in an upcoming speaking engagement I got before they would approve me coming to speak. So these people don't, don't, don't want me to do this. And they see this as if I put a major feature film up there on that screen, you know what I mean? Uh, giving you a glimpse back into that period, that era, that protest movement we had, me, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, all in the courtroom, like Abby and Hoffman. When the last day of the gagging on me, Abby and Jerry got slung back in their seats, but they would get right back up trying to protect me while they were beating me up in the chair and all that. I mean, it was something else. It was a circus, but my point is, Go. I need you to help me in every way you can. You can order my books. My, my website is my name, Bobby Seal. You can order my books. You can order this book, uh, Power to the People, that Steve and I, uh, you know, autograph it however you want it done, personalize it direct, and so on, and to help me with that because I got I to gotta try to get up a, a big program going. I'm trying to see if I can get a big program going so I can sell 100,000 copies of this book. <laughs> Thank you. All right.